Okay, so I was uh, charged to um, give a presentation and uh, encourage discussion on these four potential, potential routes to increase researcher access. Supposedly, you all um, read this on the plane coming over, and so this is more a summary uh, uh, process for you to, to remind you of uh, that reading process on the plane. Um, and just to remind you one thing, I'm actually standing in for this handsome gentleman here. That's Paul Flecheck. Um, uh, he is very sad that he can't be here, but he had a small genetics experiment uh, that successfully completed about a week ago. Uh, so uh, congratulations to Paul, Melissa, and William, uh, who is the new addition. So I'm going I'm to talk about these um, uh, some overarching goals and then these, these four areas. <laughs> One of the things, one of, one of the givens to think about this, some, some of this is about how researchers sort of formally interact with data sets. And um, it's, I mean, it's a total given, but it's worth reminding everybody that we're going to do that in a way which is consistent with the consents. It has to be consistent with the consents. Um, why are we trying to do this? Uh, so there's one business of just making research go faster. I mean, David actually expressed this far better. Um, one of the things which I'm, though, very keen on or very aware of is that there's a lot of serendipity in science. And uh, when, whenever you start pl placing barriers for what a scientist has to do to get access to something else, you cut down that chance of serendipity. And serendipity really is a huge driver and very unpredictable. And so the flatter and more open the system is, the, the more serendipity can occur. Again, this is another um, obvious statement, but, but compliance with consents is not a zero-sum game with researcher access. So there isn't some trade-off going on here. It's just about creating a system which satisfies consents and maximizes the utility of, of this data. And uh, somebody mentioned this uh, this year, I think, uh, uh, that research participants overwhelmingly seem to want to see this happen. And, and multiple times when people have gone and asked, why do people donate their uh, samples and data and sometimes go undergo quite extreme procedures if you ever do a double skin biopsy? It's not fun. I haven't done one. Um, uh, it's pretty impressive that they expect all of that to be really helping research. And so that's one of the things to, to remember. And I also am very aware of the fact that we shouldn't let a 1% or 10% or even 20% of edge cases prevent a good solution. So I think the cutoff is somewhere, maybe it's 50%. Certainly, I'm happy at an 80% solution. And so there's this business of historical consents and a business of special cases uh, for example, studies that, that are looking at things that people naturally feel uh, more, um, there's a higher risk of harm if, if this information is, uh, was de-anonymized. So there were four solutions presented in papers, and I'm going to go through each one of them uh, with a little bit of pros and cons. The pros and cons are my pros and cons and meant to stimulate debate. They're not really a summary set of pros and cons. So there's an open access uh, proposal to have anonymized identifiers for genotype and phenotype information. That means it would be hard to, um, you wouldn't have people's personal names, you wouldn't have postcodes or zip codes. Um, everything would be with anonymized identifiers, but in fact, all the data would be open and downloadable. Uh, of course, the participants have to understand this. They have to consent to this. And one's never suggesting that this is done without, outside of the, the remit of consents. So this totally maximizes the serendipity aspect of this. Interestingly enough, this is already in widespread use for molecular phenotyping, and that's because of the HapMap samples. So it's widespread because of HapMap uh, for molecular phenotyping. Of course, many people don't think of humans just as cell lines and molecular phenotypes on cell lines, um, but it's worth pointing out that there is a big use of this already. And there's an interesting question in my mind about whether it could be extended for other normal phenotypes in particular. And it's already been extended for normal and disease phenotypes. And the PGP project is a great example of that process. So what are the pros? 
Um, there's zero headache in researcher access. There's a maximal use of data, uh, reuse of data, and it's the most likely, I think, to generate or release the total utility of the data. So the cons are that there's a small but higher risk of participant harm. Um, you have to think quite carefully about this, how this would occur, but it, but it certainly can occur. Um, uh, the people, the authors of the paper, Laura and others, pointed out that there's an unknown risk of what happens for participation. So would an open access proposal change the participation rate or not? And of course, that's very hard to know unless you actually do an open access proposal uh, and see what happens, but uh, in particular by disadvantaged groups. And it's probably a harder sell to local IRB boards and would be the biggest change from current practice. So this would be the biggest change from the current way we do things. Um, and so the kind of the system would, would find it the most um, challenging to get their head around. So what about streamlining our current access? So um, in the paper that was written, again, by Adam and by some other people, there were eight points. I'm not going to list those eight points. They're, they are in your pack, as it were. But it's pretty, it's relatively ob obvious. So to consolidate DACs rather than to have a DAC for every study, to share more language and terms, to have broad consents, and to have standardized consents. And so for me, all of these are pretty relatively obvious and good things. And one should, as I'll come on, definitely do these things. There is an interesting proposal to, to change or, or to, to perhaps remove a um, precautionary pr principle that was the release of genotype numbers, so releasing openly genotype numbers. Now, I think this would be very, very useful and very powerful. Uh, some people in this room know this debate. Um, it was assumed four or five years ago that we would be able to release p-values and genotype numbers because nobody could, in aggregate, because nobody could de-anonymize from those uh, p-values and genotype numbers. But a, a very gifted geneticist went off and showed that at least in a closed world scenario where you can assign, you have somebody's genotype, you can work out whether they came from the cases or the controls. And then from that paper, because of the precautionary principle of not wanting to do something that would put participants at risk, uh, the NIH and then the Wellcome Trust said, no to the full release of p-values and of genotype numbers. Now, this, is, this, I think, is open. At the end, they say, um, why don't we change this? And I think that's a, a, a good thing. It, it's certainly worth debating uh, more properly and fully. So improves research. What are the pros and cons here? Improves researcher access. Sets up having future broad, consistent, I should have had consistent consents. Releasing genotype numbers and therefore p-values is a is a, a broadly, is a broad level of reuse that we don't do now, uh, and it would be great to do. Um, there is this very low risk if this happens, if one takes Homer at all as, the, as truth. There's people who dispute this, that this is really feasible in the real world, um, that, that there's a, you've changed the risk for the participants. But it's quite a complicated scenario because you have to genotype someone. Um, and so presumably by genotyping someone, you've already got access to that individual quite extensively. Uh, so again, it's quite a complicated thing to work through. And interestingly enough, I don't know whether this is a true con or not, but it, it's worth remembering this is our kind of current status quo. And it perpetuates the current system. And I think... My opinion is, is that we can do better than just streamlining. So researcher commons. So I think the best way to think about researcher commons is that you're, you're not changing any aspect of the consents. You're not changing any aspect of the researchers. You're not changing any aspect of the current system. You're just moving a decision ahead. You're pre-consenting. You're pre-authorizing people for consents. So there's no change required in the mechanics, the kind of the, 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 the legal mechanics of this process, except you're moving one decision to being post or inquiry to being pre-inquiry. And so individuals would be pre-authorized to see a class of data that have broad consents. So um, the this is very practical. 
in the sense that many of the research researchers could therefore become such pre-authorized individuals. We'll call these pre-authorized individuals certified researchers. Um, and then there could be large common data sets that are consistent with those consents, which certified researchers could go and access. It needs a certification authority, um, something that does this pre-authorization. In the current scheme, that is, is a DAC. And so by uh, taking the streamlining approach of having less DACs, one can imagine that all the broad consents would come under one DAC, and then that would be the person who would be doing the uh, pre-authorization. The pre and therefore, the whole thing becomes identical to the current model. It's just that a, a decision is being made at a different time. Uh, another option is to uh, effectively use other societies, for example, the American Society of Human Genetics could be one such um, uh, thing to satisfy researchers. Two other good things about certification, it's probably the case that in a certification scenario, you could ask researchers to regularly, once a year, for example, or once every two years, go and update their certification and go and, go to and see a seminar and think about it properly. And to be honest, I don't think that we do a good enough job in ensuring that researchers understand the difference between data where they have to keep uh, the, the information separate from data which is fully open. And if you go into a practicing large-scale genetics or genomics lab, there can be quite a lot of mushiness uh, between those two areas. And I think certification would help a process of of uh, keeping researchers aware of this. And the other good thing about this is that one can imagine internationalizing this. Um, and so different groups would recognize certifications across different countries would be the way you would do it. I mean, it's the obvious way. And so the US would, would recognize certifications coming from n number of countries, and n number of other countries would recognize the certification that comes from the US. And so that process, I can imagine, uh, it sounds complicated, but it's probably far less complicated than it seems because everybody would like to have the same goal of uh, a common set of accesses. So pros, it improves researcher access. Serendipitous research is more, more easily achieved and it provides a context for centralized, either institutional or more broader systems. There, I think there's a, what are the cons for this? There's a reputational risk, I think of this seeming like where the researchers are bending the rules inappropriately. I, don't, I think that's an education issue and a presentation issue rather than a real issue, but I, I think it's there to think about. So when you present this, this has to be all starting from the correct starting point of saying we want to maximize utility and we're not changing anything and we're not actually changing the way researchers interact with this data. We're just making it easier for utility to come out of it. And again, perhaps perpetuates the current system to some extent. So the fourth option, I think, is in a different class. So this is a, a, a class of option which is, which is a technical option. The three other options were really changing the formal way that researchers get authorized for access. This one is a technical solution about something like that. But it does have a little piece of interaction, and it's, a, it's on the list to discuss. So a central server that provides analysis results. You can imagine a, a whole variety of different levels here. For example, the, the important but somewhat mundane process of imputation. Um, and then going through different levels of calling and stats modeling and all sorts of different things uh, for this. There's a particular suggestion put forward in this paper that low level data, so reads, genotypes are kept private but people can use a cloud-like infrastructure or an app store-like infrastructure so that flexibility is provided for the, the precise analysis routine that is executed on top of this. So again, the pros enables more research over data sets, might provide a mid-level access option, so we would have a, a different level of access, and the heavy lifting happens only once. Now, that is also a con, the heavy lifting happening only once might cause the, uh, an almighty I.O. bottleneck that the world has never seen before, as uh, all the servers on the planet try and access five disks or something like that. Um, and actually, as well as an I.O. bottleneck, 
uh, undoubtedly there would be effectively a help desk functionality that you would have to have for this something like this, and it, it may kind of have a people bottleneck. Um, and this is kind of the analogy of kind of perpetuating the current system. For me, I think we are, we shouldn't miss the chance of doing this mundane business of releasing the full sets of p-values. I think that's underappreciated of what 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 a level of impact that would have, and we just have to decide that that's okay for there to be a, a big uh, result outside of the, um, the the near kind of statistical genetics community and going towards still people who are, I think, somewhat sophisticated, but closer to the set of biologists uh, that David mentioned. So now this is just to stimulate debate. Um, it's, not, it's not trying to summarize. So uh, the first thing to say is that these are not set up as mutually inc incompatible models. We do not have to choose one of these. You are allowed to choose all of them at the same time um, uh, for different reasons. So I think that it's a real mistake to, to, to have these as if they're in competition. Um, uh, many aspects of these are just good or, or great. Um, and uh, 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 I, I see no reason why uh, choosing to do one of them prevents us from doing uh, uh, another one. The other thing I notice in this discussion, I feel like an old man here, not least because I, I come to windowless ballrooms in Bethesda too often, uh, but uh, uh, um, I feel you know, that in these situations one must remember that the tendency is to look for new things, that's entirely appropriate, but one mustn't forget the old things as well, not least because the old things have reasonable utility. And many of the things, reasons why people complain about them is not really is because the problem itself is hard. So there's a, a little bit of moaning about dbGaP. I think that's a bit unfair because um, uh, it's mainly about policies around dbGaP rather than the actual dbGaP mechanics. Um, so uh, all of these guys should be uh, in, the, in the mix. So something old, something new, something borrowed, something blue. I don't know what the blue thing will be. So I'll leave that slide here to help stimulate some of the debate. And now it's over to you, uh, you guys for discussion. Lincoln? Yeah, I have a comment in the question. The first is a comment on the central server that I think we should avoid uh, falling into the trap of thinking that the central server is going to solve the data access policy problems. I don't think we can rely on the central server to implement uh, data restrictions on what you're using the data for, how you combine it, because sufficiently clever people can figure out how to link up different data sets via the central server's API and violate those restrictions. Yes. And so, I mean, to, to give justice to the paper about the central server, they talk about this and they basically say when you get access to the central server, you sign a document saying, I'm not going to do this. Yeah. Which is, you know, the basic document that we all sign when we get access to these data is that we're not going to do anything kind of bad, yeah. as it were. But I would, I would agree that the central server thing is in a different class of solution. It's a, it's a sort of technical solution and not necessarily a data access solution. I, I think the central server is, is, is a great, convenient, powerful thing to place on top of any of the other solutions. Yep. Yep. The, yeah. the question is um, that at, at, um, a lot of the serendipity to date has come from the ability to access raw reads and the BAM and CRAM file layer. Uh, it's becoming increasingly difficult to move these really large data sets at the raw level across the internet, and it's wasting a lot of local Bad resources right. because we each have a petabyte or so of, of disk for these mirror data sets. You, t you mentioned at one point a cloud infrastructure for accessing the higher level data sets. Do you see any possibility of providing a cloud environment, maybe on a fee-for-service basis, which would allow the computational biologists to get read-level access to So, I mean, I think this is what, I think this is what CG Hub is thinking about, or at least people placing things beside that. I know ourselves at the EBI, we are, we are actually actively piloting now um, 
uh, direct access of what we call a, a, a I, I never know whether I should call it a private cloud or community cloud. I get, I get ticked off by, by a cloud person regularly by using the wrong term. But basically a cloud that we run to let other people precisely to solve this problem. But I, I think that that problem of, of um, data movement, again, is orthogonal to the, to the access uh, criteria question. And, and I think it's useful to separate those two things out. So although I think there is an absolute problem about, or the solution is to move the compute much closer to the data, that's a separate thing from, from kind of the policy about researcher access, which I'm sure you'd agree on. Yeah. David? We would, we would certainly like to have, as you say, uh, cloud services associated with CG Hub, uh, but uh, yes. if you build something on top of CG Hub and you're, you're essentially end up redistributing the data via this mechanism, then that runs afoul of the, of the, so, the I current mean, I think policy. That, so. Yeah. so I think this comes back to this. I mean, that's what, why I think the central server, these are in the same class as the central server case of trying to say that this is an allowed scenario where an authority gives out some level of access without it being uh, in some compute environment. So I, I, I agree that there is an interaction there. And um, uh, so it, there is an interaction between policy and the technical aspects of running clouds. And so that must, for, the, for, right. for, for a cloud solution to work, some of those policies must be looked at. Right, and we need, and we need to, my main feeling here is that we really need to encourage creativity. So we want the, the, the creative solutions on top of yep. these data. There's storing the data, which is a very low level thing. Uh, yeah. thing. One, that, that should be taken care of, but then we, at this point, if we, if we do too much control and centralization and limiting of the creative things that you do with the data, we're really screwed. So but we, this is, goes to Gonzalo's and, point. I mean, I think I, I mean, the, 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 I, the uh, important thing here is, exactly. is not to set these things up as, in, as oppositions, as, right. uh, as, as uh, either ors. Right. So, so the, 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 it's totally fine for us to do both of these things, right. to allow researchers to download more data directly onto their disks with appropriate security in-house and then run things across them and to allow cloud access. You don't have to go for only one model. Right, but we need to make sure that we allow a class for a class of people who actually do um, create value added on top of the data and then redistribute sure. that value added, added to the, the medical and scientific community. So Lincoln again, is that, a, well, let's go to Mark and Mark and Mark. Go on, Mark. The Marks. So I wanted to, uh, I was glad to see your last slide that, that these are not sort of mutually exclusive or competitive activities. Yeah. And in fact, you know, one way in which I think about it is that you know, these are all good things and that some samples and some collections may be available for certain types of sharing and others may not. That doesn't have to mean they're in separate places, but we could have a solution that you know, suits that very well. I was thinking since you brought it up, I think it would be helpful to the community if at, at one point in time, whether it's in this meeting or not, we collectively did weigh in in some way, shape, or form about the genotype p-value sharing, as in the, the Homer et al. issue. Because it is a point of great confusion, and I think it would be enormously beneficial to geneticists around the world who look to groups such as this to yeah. make position statements to weigh in on this because it isn't, you know, at all consistently handled. There are many of the disease consortia that do, in fact, still produce um, full genome-wide full yeah. p-values or um, odds ratios and betas and so forth um, for public use, and I think that's a very good thing. And then there are many that don't. And then there are projects in the sequencing realm, such as the ESP project, which has put out, you know, exact allele counts. And so certainly you don't even require particularly sophisticated computational tricks to take someone's DNA sample, sequence it, and identify whether they're in that project or not. And so I think a clear articulation of what we consider reasonable risk from all the ways of considering this would be really important for the field uh, going uh, forward. Aravinda? I'm, I'm just going to sort of add to this in the way it might be useful, you know, you're already getting into the technical details of the architecture and how this is, should be distributed, but, you know, the main impediments I see are certain kinds of piece of information are pre-computable, 
And even there, we, they, I think Mark is right, there's not widespread agreement as to you know, what presents what level of danger. But I think they can be uh, listed, and I think we can discuss them. And most of them, in fact, I believe, I personally at least believe, can be shared and should be shared. Uh, whereas on the other hand, data that I need, whatever level of data that is, in order to compute something that has not been done because of whatever reason, uh, I guess you're calling that serendipitous discovery or new discoveries, that depending on the data that you need is different levels of you know, guard that one needs to put up. And it may be useful just to separate them because one is much more easily done than the other and most of the impediments are, as Mark said, confusion or their cultural issues, whatever, whereas the other one is a very, very different issue, very important on how we can compute on the total amount of data and make new decisions. I, well, I think this is an excellent discussion. And let me just repeat that I think it would just be brilliant if an outcome of this meeting is uh, a re-evaluation of Homer et al. Um, I know of people who have attempted, I know that there's been papers about this. Steve has been an author of one of them. I know that David Balding's done some analysis on this and actually didn't manage to get it published because it wasn't considered cool enough because it was saying that it doesn't work. Uh, um, uh, um, uh, and so there's a whole bunch of different people here, I think, who, and so at the, at the moment, just practically, we or, or you know, browsers are not allowed to put up p-values. I mean, that's the, that's the truth of the matter. Uh, and that's because of this, ru this ruling, as it were. Who is browser and who governs that? So, so the, it's the DAX and the NIH have made this precautionary policy, and the Wellcome Trust DAC made a precautionary policy. So, so I mean, there, there's a clear piece of governance. There, isn't, there, isn't a, there is a very clear piece of governance. It's about informing that piece of governance about what should happen. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I don't think actually that's the case. Each consortia on its own are making up the rules on one side or the other. Well, so other. I think that's... So I, I think, think that's that's as a community, we could speak. We could speak to the pros and cons of that. It would be good just to clarify that little bit. Yeah, I can believe the community, but that doesn't mean, so just to, just, I mean, Mark asked the question, why are we not doing it? And I, I, I gave the straight answer. Why are we not doing it? I don't know if that's a bad at all. So, but. Yeah. I'm just pointing out that many of us are actually doing it. Yeah. So, right. Yeah, I mean, I think that one thing that would be really clear is, is actually articulate what our current view as a community is. There's no yeah. kind of position paper on what's easy to share. And, and, and the default right now even though there are exceptions, you know, Mark said, you know, sometimes in, in his disease studies, they will share the full list of results. The default is very much not sharing, you know, which is kind of odd. You know, this data has very little value to you once you've published your yeah, paper, yeah. but has a lot of value to other people that want to do follow-up studies on it. And, and, and you, you're basically cutting off all that, you know, because you you, you think you're, you're doing the right thing in, in some way. Well, so I think, I think it's excellent that we're coming together. Sorry, so, uh, Debbie? No, I, I was just going to say a lot of this data is, it, the journals have it. It's at the back and in supplemental information in the publications. But not, not the full p-value list. Not, the, not full, the full, but I agree. It the, should be, it full, could be gotten The full p-value list is not in the, it, yeah. it's not in the supplement. Yeah. Sorry. Over there. So, um, I mean, the original Homer paper focused mainly on allele frequencies and genotype counts, but I think the main kind of objective of having ways of assessing risk, I mean, that's something that's agreeable. Now, one of the things I don't see addressed here is you could talk about genotypes and p-values, but as we get to rare and rare variants, it's more important to be able to share those. And so I, I think the challenges become a little bit larger because there, there is this question of whether or not somebody wants to be identified if there is somebody who would have access to their DNA and we're all in public places. So I think those are good questions too. Mark and David? Well, that's why I give the ESP project a great deal of credit because they have put out all of this information on a base by base, count by count basis. And maybe there's some you know, discussions that would illuminate the rest of the group from within that group as to how that decision was arrived at because it is of enormous value and has contributed to many serendipitous discoveries in the last year because, to their credit, that project has done this. And I think you know, we need to be cognizant of the positives that can come from that kind of sharing as well as, as, you know, as perceived or imagined right. risks. David, sorry, and then Lincoln. David? So, 
as I see the, the I, I think it's good that you said all of the above and they're not mutually incompatible. I think it's important that we realize that they're actually like all components, although I'd be in favor of having multiple attempts at this for the exact reason that serendipity doesn't just come in the analyst having access to the data, but in different people trying to solve this kind of problem. But nonetheless, to me, these all look like different layers or switches thrown on on one or multiple systems. What I mean is, if the data is together, and again, I don't want it to be in one place, it could be in multiple places, but if the data is together, some data will say, I think this is what Mark was saying, it's available for open access. So you flip the switch and everyone can access it. Some way of dealing with the data is you want access to the individual data. You can always go get it yourself and put it on your computer, or you could work in a research commons. Some people might say, there's some, you know, there's some way of interacting with it where they want to use the, they're not compute, they're not the serendipitous computational people who are only one of the many communities we should serve. They're people of questions but are not computational people who right now are not served unless they can get the ear of a computational person. And then you could also release or not the p-values and the variant counts. In other words, these are all layers of access and ways of interacting with what we do not have yet, which I, I just, as we think about this, which is even if individual cohorts and projects are coming together, they're not all together, I guess everyone agrees to that. So there's like a big win here if we can figure out how to get it together and recognize that there's not gonna be one size fits all, but they're like different layers of access and they're all elements potentially of what you want. They're not mutually exclusive options. Lincoln? And just, just drawing back a little bit from the specifics to the philosophy of access control, I think we should be moving away from a supply side data accesses where, where we're controlling what data researchers can access, and two, uh, to a focus on what the researchers uh, are, are, are doing with that data. This is, this is why I think that the certified researcher model is actually very useful, because then the international or national community has a club. If a researcher does something egregiously bad with the data, such as de-identifies a, a patient, they can withdraw his certification and it basically puts him out of the research business. He can no longer access yep. any of the data sets. And I think that that's the individual responsibility should rest on the researcher and we need effective controls on, on the researcher's behavior. We should stop trying to put our fingers in the dikes of the databases because that ultimately is self-defeating. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah. Um, I think streamlining is very important, but I guess I, the question I would ask you is um, the comment that you made that research participants are overwhelmingly in support of this, uh, not my experience. I'd certainly drop the overwhelmingly. Okay. Um, uh, this and, may be my, uh, entirely okay. my bias of, of, the, of the cohorts I've interacted with. Okay, but I think um, uh, and those, opinion, who, a, those who are in favor are in favor of it, but with um, conditions. And there is a much larger push right now for control of both uses and people and users and wanting to get information back. I mean, you look at who's willing to put anything into a, quote, bank, you know, the two highest, uh, uh, the two most important features are, A, I get research results back, and B, I get paid. So I, my fear on, on all the streamlining, I think we also have to look at what's happening from the public's perspective in terms of they want to participate in this. And it's not just giving something, they want to hear back. And my, a little bit of my fear of like opening this up widely is how do you possibly address that issue? Because you know, if, that, if the supply drives up, um, you know, we're all dead in the water. So, I, I mean, I, I appreciate that, and I, I'm aware here there may be a cultural difference. I'm hanging out with too many Scandinavians, and they are incredibly, you know, yeah, of course, you want my body for research? Yeah. Uh, um, <laughs> so, uh, um, it's kind of, uh, yeah, so it's, um, it, the, <laughs> kind of, yeah, they're great. Um, so, I think these, I mean, I think this has to be handled sensitively and responsibly. And um, uh, remind, I mean, I think you very often, in my experience, have to go back to the top and, and remind everybody, why are we just doing this in the first place? And then you bring people down to the specific. And it doesn't surprise me that, that you know, one has to go back and say, look, it's actually a, you know, it's a basic human health thing. That's what we're trying to achieve and go back and forth and down there. 
And so I am, that's why in those cons, if you notice, I did put reputational risk of the kind of system. And so I'm less, personally, I'm less worried about the mechanics. I think that's handleable. What I think would be a bit of a disaster is if there was a kind of reputational risk of researchers saying, well, they're cooking the rules for themselves. And that's, that's not what we're trying to do, but it, it's not only important that we understand that, but we also present that correctly. Um, so, so you, you know, one just has to handle this appropriately. Yes. Sorry, I don't and, know. Um, and, and I don't want to necessarily represent the ESP conversation on the variant server. Maybe, Debbie, did you have, did, did you want to, I mean, I can, I, can, I can make a comment on what I remember from the discussion, because I think it's relevant to this. I can um, comment about sure. it. Sure. The thing is that this comes back to my earlier comment about our constituents we need to think about are the cohorts and the populations that are providing the data, but also I strongly believe data should be available, p-values and that kind of thing. And what was discussed is that in aggregate, by having a lot of cohort data together, that provided a level of anonymity that individual cohort from one um, place like Framingham where, where I work um, doesn't have. Mm -hmm. And that that, that that level of risk, there was a consensus discussion that that level of risk was therefore lower. And I think that's what we're seeing with Giant and other of these big consortia where they're putting the data out there because basically all of the cohorts have agreed that, that by putting all those data together, the risk is lower. Now is there data to support that? Is there, has there been a study to show that? Some people have looked at that, but um, I'm not sure if that's been published. I mean, but that, well, that may I'm, be one thing that could come out of this but, meeting, but, is that the risk could be lower by having the larger... Well, so, I mean, I think there's a kind of consensus, modern-day consensus opinion of running maybe big cohorts or something like that. And if we can formalize that, write it down, and publish it, that is the, that is the way scientists communicate with other scientists. I think that would be just an excellent thing. And then we can take those publications to our appropriate backy people and say go have a look at this, which I think would be excellent. But, but there's a little bit of caution that has to be when you're, when you're enrolling in a study and there may be 15,000 schizophrenia individuals in a schizophrenia cohort, the neighbor being able to determine that you were in a, this study is something that some people wouldn't want. And so it depends on nature and that's where it's evaluating the risk. In Framingham, what is the risk, right? And a BMI study, you know, what is the risk? So I think that's, I think that's, I mean, one of that goes back to this very early thing I said about the 80-20 rule. And in the Scottish study in Tayside, they have a, a very interesting view. Uh, so you can access an awful amount of information when you're authorized um, because the entire Scottish healthcare system is at your disposal at that point. Um, but in fact, you're only allowed to access certain information in a closed room with no USB key. You walk up to the thing, but that's a that's the sex offenders register and that sort of thing is in that class. Whereas BMI <coughs> is something that you can transfer uh, into a secure location somewhere else. So I think I think this business of of a risk. So that is taking in the probability of something happening plus the is it harm or hazard? I'm just too late for me. Harm, thank you. Uh, so the harm of what would happen um, uh, uh, is, is the right thing. And so, so it's totally appropriate for us to have a nuanced view between different studies and say this study is, is, is off the table for this class of access because the, the, the risk is higher because of the level of harm to the participant if, the, if it's de-anonymized. Uh, yes, so at the back, I'm sorry I can't read your name. Quick note, um, so I'm not a lawyer, but I, I play one on TV, and in some regards there is precedent for, for what you're talking about in the law with respect to the management of information in a manner that is not necessarily impregnable to harm or even risk, but is sufficiently protected, and, and there, are, there is a lot of case study around this in various domains. And so I would, I would encourage this community to look at some of those domains. So it happens in epidemiology, and it, it also happens in, in just medicine in general. Um, the other thing that I, I wanted to, to voice was that um, if, I, I'm very hesitant to support open access in this domain, particularly because we do not know all of the harms that, that could transpire at this time. Um, and, and while I do agree that you should be sharing this information, it's extremely dangerous to do so in a manner when you do not necessarily know who is downloading or using the information. 
So, so all of this has to be predicated in the context of you have to set up not necessarily access control, but some ability to authenticate the individuals that are downloading this information before you set it out free. Okay, it, so it's I'm, just necessary for auditing purposes. I'm sorry, I'm unaware of, of whether we were, the session is out of time or not. Okay, two more questions. Okay, two more questions. Right, okay. Next door. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, make a comment on the earlier issue of uh, public responses and, and so on. And I think the uh, contrast with Scandinavian countries is interesting because I think they, my impression at least, is, is that they've had a level of uh, uh, public discourse that, that hasn't happened so much in, in North America. Uh, and for <laughs> instance, with residual blood spots in Denmark, this was, was discussed and so on. And, and from Canada, we have similar results uh, with people saying, you know, yes, in principle, we think this is a great idea, but calling for some more participation and, and transparency. I mean, I think it's definitely a societal thing, but maybe it's saunas. Who knows? We've got to do the epidemiology of that. Uh, so, sorry. Jake. I, I don't think Last it's one. anything that silly, actually. I think it's access to health care. So, I, as someone who consents people for genome sequencing, there are a lot of uninsured people or people who are terrified of losing their insurance, who can't afford life insurance, and so their concerns about their data compared to someone in a country that has a much stronger social safety net are hugely different. And so I think if we're talking about United States participants, the, there's gonna be a huge variety and it will be culturally very different and socioeconomically, I think, quite different with regard to people's willingness to have open access. And, and Gina doesn't change the landscape for that? No because it doesn't protect you against life insurance, it doesn't ah, okay. protect you against long-term disability insurance, and even if you talk about health insurance, and I'm not a lawyer either here or on TV, uh, I think the definition of insurance is actually a little vague. Um, okay. I think it has to be an employer with 50 employees or something, I may be wrong about that, but there clearly are very real issues that it doesn't protect against. All right, so thank you very much. Uh, good discussion all round. Um, I think it's over to Laura.